As a farmer, I've lived through some tough times, uh, seen disasters, uh, had to scrape, uh, but I can tell you, I, I don't think I've ever seen anything like 2018. Uh, I'm a farmer, and, it, and farmers start off the new year with an optimism uh, and hope that the year is going to be better than the last one. Uh, the markets are going to be strong and plentiful, and the hard work is going to be rewarded, and very little of that happened in 2018, and that optimism wore off pretty quickly, I can tell you. We had chronically low commodity prices, trade disputes and tariffs, nuisance lawsuits against our pork industry, widespread storm damage and flooding uh, that was the worst we had ever seen in history, and it seemed like it was just one blow after another that was dealt to the farming community. Days after the storm came through, we estimated ag losses at $1.1 billion, and today that figure still holds true. Ultimately, we had 70 counties that received a presidential or secretarial disaster declaration, either from Hurricane Florence or Tropical Storm Michael, uh, and unfortunately, this was about a month after Florence hit. Uh, the bad news, too, is the storm hit the largest agricultural counties, and these counties actually accounted for 9.6 billion of the 11.59 billion uh, in ag cash receipts at the farm gate in 2017. Uh, the timing couldn't have been any worse, so we were just beginning to harvest crops, and, and unlike when Matthew came through, uh, we had had some harvest of crops during uh, before Matthew came through, this time it was not true. I can tell you after the storms, I did a lot of touring to see exactly what the disaster looked like and went to the hardest hit areas and I talked to a lot of farmers across the state of North Carolina. Farmers are a tough bunch of people, there's no question about it. They, they're nothing new to them when diversity hits, but I tell you, I saw pain, I saw fear, uh, I saw desperation in their eyes, and I saw tears running down their face. Now, what that told me is we were in something that we had never seen before, and I could feel the, the struggles that each one of them were going through in the, the farm business, and, and I knew we were facing an agricultural crisis like something we had never seen in history. Um, I also knew without help, we were going to lose a, a good number of farmers in North Carolina, something that we cannot afford to do. Uh, and even with disaster assistance, I, you know, I know we're going to still lose some farmers. And, and not only from Florence, but uh, if you've been hit by Matthew three years earlier, and then you get Florence, and commodity prices are so low, uh, it's, it's a pretty bleak situation. Uh, but I, being a farmer, I'm always optimistic, and I'm always looking at the glass being in half full, not half empty. And some things that I saw were much more than a uh, half filled glass of water. The, the glass was actually full. The first of those was uh, our legislators stepped up uh, and provided support and assistance in the aftermath of these storms uh, and in the face of the nuisance lawsuit. So for that support, I can't thank them enough. Uh, in addition, our ag community rallied around each other, uh, raising money, donating hay, loaning equipment to get crops out of the fields, and, and just anything that people could do to help a neighbor, they did it. Our state commodity associations, uh, the Farm Bureau, uh, Baptism uh, Mission, uh, and other faith-based organizations stepped up to provide aid and assistance to people, especially who had lost their uh, homes, their belongings, uh, and needed food. Uh, Richard Brunson was up here, and we have been with them and seen the work they do, and it's absolutely amazing. But I think Richard will tell you the work is nowhere near complete. We still have a lot of people that are out of their homes, uh, that has lost their possessions. So it, the work is going to go on for years, and I encourage every one of you in here to volunteer to help or to make donations so that others can help. So I want to publicly thank our legislators for their support. Uh, 
We normally take care of ourselves as best we can, but this is one of those times that the resources that were required uh, just overwhelm. So I'm going to ask them to stand as I call their name, and I hope that we've got everybody's name that's here. I'm going to start with Senator Brent Jackson, a farmer himself. <laughs> Senator Eddie, Eddie Gallimore. <laughs> Representative Jimmy Dixon. <laughs> Representative Carl Hall. Representative William Brimson, Brisson. <laughs> Representative Larry Strickland. <laughs> Representative John Ager. <laughs> Representative Joe Sam Queen. <laughs> Representative Alan McNeil. And Representative Naseth Mahid. Now, have I missed any legislators that are here that we did not identify? Thank you so much. And I'm sorry the lights are so bright up here I can barely see. A very familiar name, Rachel Hunt. Are there any others that we missed? Well, from the bottom of my heart and from the bottom of the heart of the people of rural North Carolina and agriculture, we thank you for stepping up to the plate and doing everything that you could do to help us. Uh, and I want to remind everybody on March the 20th, we're going to have Ag Day uh, in Raleigh, and uh, we're going to be coming up here in droves to tell the legislators thank you for the help that they have afforded us and asking for their continued support. So I hope I'll see every one of you up here on March the 20th. Please contact your Farm Bureau to get details about uh, transportation and what we're going to do that day. So we went to the legislature and we asked for what some people described as a gazillion dollars in help for ag. Uh, I knew there was going to be sticker shock when we went to the first legislative committee hearing. Uh, we asked for uh, $250 million, and that is a lot, a lot of money. I didn't get $250 million, but I got $240 million. Uh, and that, that is astounding considering the, the losses that there are across North Carolina. We think this represents about 20% of the losses uh, that are out there. And uh, while it's not making anybody whole, we hope it's enough to get people on a bridge to the future. And, and that's what it's designed to do. The amazing thing was uh, we went through the first committee hearing and it was again a unanimous vote. Uh, we went through the second committee hearing, and it was a unanimous vote. It went to the Senate floor, it was a unanimous vote. It went to the House floor, and it was a unanimous vote, and the governor signed the legislation. Now, considering the politically charged environment that we all live in, this is absolutely amazing. Uh, so everybody recognized the need, they recognized the dire situation, so now it's up to us and the Department of Ag to uh, make sure that this money gets out and it gets out uh, like it needs to be. The other thing that I saw that was a, a glass pool during this whole thing that happened was the partnerships. Uh, the partnerships between people in the ag community, the farm organizations, the commodity groups, uh, our federal partners, and it all went together and it clicked. Uh, everybody stepped up to the plate and worked as hard as they could work, uh, and, and I'm thankful for that. But what I also saw was something that I already knew, 
how fortunate and blessed I am to work with a group of people in the Department of Agriculture that come to work every day to help people, that come to work to do their job, and they really have compassion for their fellow man. So I can't thank them enough for what they did in the division after division after division after division. They did what they had to do to get things done. So I couldn't be any prouder of the Department of Agriculture. I know I've got a lot of employees here today. So if you folks would stand up and, and I hope you will join me in thanking them for the job they've done. That brings us up, up to today. Uh, we've got to put 18 behind us and move into 19, and we have an ongoing effort in the department to get the $240 million distributed. Uh, we've received over 7,000 applications for state disaster assistance. So yesterday I was, a ple I was pleased to announce the first round of checks went out. Uh, it totaled over $15.2 million uh, in the mail to farmers, and. The good news is we're going to put another thousand in the mail tomorrow and we will continue this process until every application that is complete and timely is processed and paid. Uh, as a man of my word, I can guarantee you that if your application is in and it is timely, we're going to work with you to make sure that it's clear and you're going to get a check. So that's the good news, I think. And, and even today, uh, we've got people that would love to be here, but they are reviewing applications and, and trying to get these checks out. Uh, Dr. Sandy Stewart was instrumental in developing the program, uh, and I wanted him to come up now and just give you a, a, a little bit of overview of how we came through these calculations to get these checks out. Sandy? Thank you, Commissioner. We we have uh, we have had a lot of questions about how these how these checks will be written and what on what basis what the payment determination, if you will, will be will be determined and how that will be determined. It'll be based on rather than individual losses, we're looking at county losses, county averages in terms of yield and uh, and reported loss. And so the payments will be based on county losses reported by either FSA or in many, many cases, our losses have been determined by county task forces that have been put together that include Extension, FSA, Regional Agronomists, NRCS, and other agencies that work within the counties. The average county yield is established through the USDA's uh, National Agricultural Statistics Service. Uh, that has been established and, and determined over the years. We're looking at the top four yields out of the past five years and average price is reported also by NAS and that's on a statewide average and again the highest price the highest four out of the last five and so when you put that together and if you can there we go a sample calculation would look like that with the first bullet point is the loss the overall loss would equal that FSA reported acreage so what are applicants simply had to do in most cases was report what they have verified and reported to FSA on their form 578. So that's their reported acreage. Multiply that by the county average yield, the average price, and then that reported loss as, a, as determined either by FSA or by our county task forces. And so as an, as an example here, if we assume that the reported acreage on a 578 with 100 acres of cotton that county average, let's assume it's 900 pounds, the average price being 72 cents, and in this example, a county loss might be determined to be 50% of the cotton crop across the county. Then that loss, if you do all the math on that, equals $32,400 on that 100 acres that a producer reported. The payment will not be $32,400. What that 32,400 represents, when you add up all of the commodities, it represents a total loss for that applicant. You put that together with all the applicants in the program in all 70 counties across the state, and that is, a, that is representative of a prorated share of the total appropriation. And so 
so that is just sort of an overview of how we went through this looking at, uh, at again, the number that is most verifiable is that 578 number has already been reported to FSA and then everything else is based on county averages for loss and yield. Thank you, Sandy. We developed this program, uh, one, to be fair, uh, two, to be equitable, and three, to put a program together to make sure that the least amount of fraud was out there. We've worked with our internal auditors uh, all across the, the program to, to identify how we can put in uh, steps that uh, would help us in, in the case that we suspected any incomplete information or wrong information. So uh, we think we've done that. We, uh, we do want to be very good stewards of the state's money. So uh, the process uh, is reviewable, auditable, and every application that we are printing a check for has been reviewed by some, some of our staff to make sure that the information looks correct. So I think we've done a really good job with that. Uh, I, I put my chief deputy, uh, David Smith, uh, as the head of this, and he's been through uh, hurricane relief disasters in uh, the St. Floyd. We did Operation of Rotter Day in the mountains. We've also done hay relief, so uh, he has a lot of experience. And then Dewitt De Hardy and his staff at Farmland Preservation have been the backbone of this. Uh, Dewitt has also gone through the, the hurricanes and disasters before. Uh, they're used to uh, doing this kind of work and they have done a magnificent job and I thank them for what they're doing. Um, around 600 applications are out there and they've been awaiting FSA offices to reopen and they're open now and we certainly hope that our farmers are going to have uh, all of this information complete by tomorrow, February 1st. Uh, to get any remaining information in 578 forms in the application. Uh, it's critical that we finish the application so that we know exactly what we're doing uh, with the county by county. And this has been a moving target. Uh, we started this process when I walked into the legislature the first time. There were 31 declared disaster counties in North Carolina. Today there are 70. Uh, during the federal shutdown, there were nine pending counties that had not been signed by the secretary and signed off by all the agencies in Washington. And we've been getting a lot of calls about, uh, is, are these counties clear now? So they are clear, uh, the last nine counties, and I just want to name those so that if you see somebody, that you can tell them, you know, everything's good. But those counties are Davie, Edgecombe, Franklin, Forsyth, Halifax, Martin, Rockingham, Stokes, and Surrey. So they're all clear, uh, eligible, and if their applications are complete, they will get their checks just like uh, everybody else. Uh, one more time, this is not going to make farmers whole, but we are, do think we're building that bridge to the field, uh, for the future. I know that farmers are making decisions right now on what they're going to do in 19. Uh, I know right now they need these checks to get financing for the coming year, uh, so believe me, we're doing everything we can do. Uh, I'm going to ask farmers to be patient uh, and let us work through the application. Uh, we may have to call to verify some of the information that's provided uh, or if there's missing information. Uh, but the thing is, if we keep getting calls and calls and calls, we've got a limited number of staff to work on this, and every time one of them has to answer a call and talk to somebody, it takes away from the speed that we're going to be able to get them out. So it's going to happen. Uh, I hope it's going to happen really quickly, but you're going to get paid. Uh, what we're doing right now is working on an online database uh, that will allow farmers to go in and check the status of their application by entering their reference number that was sent to them by email when they filled out the application. So that, that will be up shortly. That will eliminate the need for a phone call. And please uh, check this to see what the status is. We hope to have uh, these checks out this first round, I'll say first round of checks out just, you know, just as soon as possible. 
Uh, we could never have done this without a lot of partners. Uh, it's amazing how we pulled together, but uh, you've heard a lot about the partners that were out there, but we've, we've leaned a lot on FSA data. Uh, and Lynn was here and talked about this morning, but Lynn, I can't thank you and all of the people at FSA and the state board for all the assistance that uh, you've given us to get this done. Uh, the extension service at NC State and A&T have been wonderful in helping us do all this work. Uh, NAS, we mentioned National Agricultural Statistics, they're housed in the department, but they are a federal partner. D. Webb heads that up. She has been uh, unbelievable in helping us get all this stuff done. Soil and water, NRCS, and the list goes on and on. But uh, this has been a true partnership to get this done, and for that, Thank you so much. Um, I talked about the agriculture part of it. How about forestry? Uh, I think you know that the winds from these hurricanes caused a tremendous amount of forest damage and the legislature allocated 2.5 million to replant trees as part of our reforestation program. The good news is we've had a huge backlog in this program. Uh, with this money, and the other money that we would normally have, we think we can plant an awful lot of trees in North Carolina. And uh, I do uh, want to encourage people to use what is called the Florence Reforestation Fund to make sure that North Carolina remains green and growing. Uh, this, is a, the, this is in uh, 52 presidentially declared counties. Now, there's a difference in a presidential and a secretarial designation. Presidential usually means that the county is, uh, is eligible for FEMA assistance. So this is for the 52 presidentially declared counties. Uh, and this is especially important to small woodland owners to make sure that uh, these forests get replanted. Uh, it's available for both site preparation and for tree, for, uh, tree planting projects. And, uh, they can receive up to 100 acres of cost share funding from the program. Uh, it is first come, first serve, serve so don't dilly-dally around to go uh, sign up for this program. Uh, work with your local North Carolina Forest Service ranger or, or consulting forester to apply to this. We've talked a lot about 2018, and I think we'll be talking about 2018 20 years from now. Uh, it's been my recollection as a farmer, I remember all of the really bad years. They really make an impression on you. Some of the good years you forget, but we'll be talking about this for, for many, many years to come. Uh, but we gotta move forward. Uh, what are we gonna do in 2019 uh, to go forward and be successful? And I think the question is, will ag remain North Carolina's number one industry? Absolutely, it's going to happen. Uh, I know that we were staggered, but we're still standing. It's also been my experience that once you get hit like this, uh, you remember it and you become smarter. So I think part of the, the thing that we've got to do as a state moving forward is try to figure out how we don't get hit this hard again. Uh, I would like to think that we've had uh, two 500 year floods in three years, so maybe a thousand years we're good, but I'm not so sure. Uh, has there been climate change? Absolutely. It's, happened. it's been happening for hundreds and thousands of years. Is this a cycle or is this something permanent? I don't think anybody really knows, but I don't want to go on the assumption that it'll never happen again. So there's, there's some long term things that we need to talk about uh, at the state level, I think. Uh, one of them is how do we clean out the waterways and rivers so that they drain better? Uh, how do we handle the water that's coming out of the Piedmont uh, from all of the uh, building that's happened in the I-85 forwarded corridor with all the concrete, asphalt, rooftops? I don't think we paid enough attention to that, and as a result, it doesn't take as much rain now up in the Piedmont to flood eastern North Carolina. I think that's got to be a serious discussion that we as a state uh, take on. There's been a, you know, a mention out there of an expanded uh, hog lagoon buyout. 
Uh, are there whole lagoons out there that uh, are a threat of being flooded again? There could be. Uh, if it, we get another 500 year flood to two years from now, absolutely. Uh, we're going to bet on the floodplain maps that are out there now that say there's a 500 year floodplain and a 100 year floodplain. Well, I know that places flooded that were in no floodplain. So that's another slice of work I think that uh, has absolutely got to be done. But if we're going to have any discussion about an additional uh, hog lagoon buyout, and there's one going on right now, I think it's got to be done in a larger context. It's got to be done in the context of uh, look at the whole picture. What I saw during Hurricane Florence was amazing. Uh, we had eight trillion gallons of water fall out of the sky. We had river flooding, the worst that this state has ever seen. And during that period of time, we had five hog lagoons that breached out of 3,300. We had an additional 20 that were overtopped in some cases, and, and maybe some effluent got out, maybe not. But what I did see is every municipal waste treatment plant in these flooded areas stayed, every one of them. Uh, I talked to county officials that talked about how difficult it was to get these uh, plants back up and operational and the things that happened during the flood that were just atrocious. So if we're going to have that discussion, let's open it up and let's have a discussion about what's good for North Carolina in the future. We're going to hope we never have another 500 year flood, but I had rather spend the time and money preparing for this not to happen that I had spend the money afterwards trying to pick up the pieces. I think, I think that's just good policy. So I hope we have that discussion and Ag certainly will do its part uh, to do what needs to be done. There are things in agriculture in North Carolina that are, are problematic right now. Uh, I think it's time that we took a serious look at new crops, uh, do the research on these crops to see if they're going to work, uh, and one of the really problematic areas is tobacco land. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's some things out there that maybe are fixable, some things maybe not. But when I know that we're competing against countries whose uh, currency rate is four to one against the United States currency, uh, most people don't ride by a gas station selling 25 cent gas to go buy a dollar gas. And that's kind of where we are. We're competing against a different standard of living in a lot of cases. Uh, we know we've got the best quality, but, and, I, and I've asked the question of the companies, why are you buying this tobacco when we know we've got much better tobacco? And the answer was, it's good enough. And if it's good enough, I don't know what we do about that. But we've got to take a look at new crops, emerging crops, and, and we have uh, 485 thousand dollars in grants that have gone out there that uh, they're going to look at issues like industrial hemp which right now is at the forefront of emerging crops uh, the feasibility of producing purple carrots in North Carolina for natural food coloring natural food coloring is a big big thing now uh, and can we grow some crops that uh, can do that yeah I'm sure we can we just need to understand how and if it's profitable uh, a new species of poplar tree that is suitable for, for, for veneering. Uh, I think that's a, an exciting possibility that we can do here in North Carolina. Poplar trees do very, very well here. Veneering poplar is very, very high price. So we're gonna take a look at that. Um, we're still looking at bioenergy research projects. Uh, one of the successes that have come out of this is uh, pellets for pullets. And what this project does is uh, poultry houses are being heated with, by burning wood pellets. Uh, we are now exporting a lot, a lot of wood pellets to the European community for the production of power. So if we're making them here, we're growing the trees here, and there's a benefit, then we need to take a, a more serious look at that. What we know the results show that uh, there is a reduction in moisture in the house, uh, fossil fuel byproducts, and there's a better product reaching the market as a result. That's something we're going to take a, a close look at. Industrial hemp, I talked about that. We have done 
uh, in North Carolina through the Industrial Hemp Commission a great job with the pilot program to get to the point that we think we can grow industrial hemp here in North Carolina and do it well. Uh, it fits in well with uh, especially tobacco operations for drying uh, and it does take labor in a lot of cases so it, it fits in pretty good. It's exploded. Uh, last month, the Industrial Hemp Commission approved 75 new applications, and of January 24th, we have 492 licensed growers, 6,637 acres uh, licensed to be grown outdoors, and then listen to this, 2.7 million square feet of production in greenhouses. Uh, we also have 322 registered processors now in North Carolina. Uh, just to compare that, I'm going to give you the numbers from last year at this time. We had 124 licensed hemp growers, 2,200 acres uh, licensed outside, and 242,000 square feet of indoor greenhouse uh, cultivation space licensed, and 44 licensed processors. So I told you the interest has been strong, and it is really strong, but I've got to throw in a word of caution. I am really afraid that my theory on agricultural economics is going to take place. And that is, if you put a good profit margin in front of a farmer, he's going to farm his way out of it as quickly as he can by overproduction. Now that's market response. We're real good at it. You saw this morning the, the stocks that we have of uh, grain now. But I think we can overproduce this very quickly, and, and we're going to try to craft a program in North Carolina that helps with this. Uh, him not being a Schedule One narcotic now under the Farm Bill is, is a big deal. It's going to open it up. We've got to have a program in North Carolina. We will be going to the legislature for proposals uh, to put a permanent program into place that meets USDA guidelines. Uh, there's another thing that we have uh, we're thinking about, and I think it's got to be done. Uh, we're going to ask the legislature for the ability of our food and drug division to regulate the production of CBD oil. Uh, we have seen cases in North Carolina where it's being done in outbuildings, in kitchens, uh, with no regard to sanitation or to the efficacy of the product. So we're going to ask for that authority to make sure that, uh, that if it's being produced, it's good for human consumption, it's safe, and you know what's in it. Uh, in addition to that, we may be considering bonding requirements for people that are going to be out purchasing uh, hemp. We've had a lot of cases of people that have grown the product and never got paid for it. So I think if you're going to do this, and we're going to do it right, and in the beginning is the time to set the parameters to make this thing successful. So we're going to be looking at that, and uh, we, we've got several goals in place. The number one thing is we got to comply with the law uh, to grow hemp, not marijuana. Uh, the other thing is we're going to full, fulfill our responsibilities to protect public health. We do this every day in the Department of Agriculture with the things that we do. And we want to have a program that is beneficial to our farmers and the ag economy and make sure that there is a good possibility if you plant it, you're going to get paid for what you do. That would be what we will be asking for in the legislative session. And uh, I look forward to the discussions on this and to make this uh, successful. We've got uh, a lot of things we can do in North Carolina. One of them is food processing and manufacturing. And we have an initiative up at the Kannapolis campus with NC State University to, to, is, to do innovative research into food manufacturing. In fact, it's the Food Innovation Lab of North Carolina. Uh, the Dean Richard Lett and I both believe that this is going to be the best thing since sliced bread. We have seen a tremendous amount of interest in We've been lucky to hire uh, a director for this facility, Dr. Bill Amitus. Uh, he brings an unbelievable amount of experience in food processing and production with him to the job, and uh, this is going to be good. It's about 10,000 square feet, and it's going to be uh, GMP certified when it's done, which means that it can go and be test marketed uh, to the public after it's developed there. So we're going to do that. Uh, 
we have Dean Linton's uh, Plant Science Initiative that we think will make us, will make North Carolina uh, one of the world's most, uh, the foremost state in, uh, in plant sciences, which is what the future is going to be about. At the department, we're building the North Carolina Agricultural Science Center, and if you leave here and you go up Edwards Mill Road and turn right on Reedy Creek, it's coming out of the ground. Uh, this lab did not turn my hair white, but if we don't soon get everything in budget, I won't have any hair at all. Uh, we picked a terrible time to build something. Uh, prices have escalated probably 20 to 30 percent since we started this project, and uh, so it's, it's, it's been difficult, but we're, we're handling it and, uh, and doing it well. And I told my folks that when we started this thing, we specked out a Cadillac. It's going to be there for 40 to 50 years serving North Carolina, and I refuse to put uh, a Model T in its place. So that's been kind of the, the point of contention. Uh, we, there's some corners we can't cut. There's some corners we won't cut. But in the end, this is something that uh, North Carolina is going to be proud of, and we will get it done. Uh, in fact, I think we're going to start putting steel up this week. Uh, it's 225,000 square feet that will house five labs that we have in the department, and it's sorely needed, uh, so I look forward to that. I mentioned tobacco challenges. Uh, when the Chinese pulled out of the market uh, this past year because of the trade wars and tariffs, it left about a $65 million, million pound hole and pretty much collapsed the market. I guess the good news is, with the hurricanes, we didn't produce the tobacco anyway, so here we are today. But if we don't get China back in this market, uh, this year, with addition to the 65 million that uh, did not get taken in last year, it's gonna probably mean another 35, 40 million this year, so we're looking at a 100 million pound hole. This is about 25 to 30% of the total crop uh, that we grow in North Carolina. So I guess what I'm saying is, farmers that get these payments uh, need to be very cautious about what they do with it. I anticipate this year being the worst in tobacco that we have seen in a long, long time. So uh, it may take a year or more to get everything worked out to where we have some stability again, but right now there is basically very little stability and a lot of instability, so just be careful. I mentioned Ag Awareness Day, and I'm gonna tell you one more time, please come to the legislature uh, on Ag Day and help us thank our legislators. And, and I wanna tell you what we're going through in North Carolina. Rural North Carolina, for the most part, is losing population. The large cities and the, the big urban counties are gaining po population. Our rural legislators that are working so hard for us, uh, you know, they could be in danger at any time of being overwhelmed by, by legislators that don't understand the value of this, this business. And we used to say that there was 2% of us that fed the other 98%. Maybe that's not true anymore. Maybe it's less than 1% feeding the 99 plus percent of the rest of the population. Try to think about educating the 99% if you're the 1%. It's a very, very difficult task to take on. It's one we've got to do. Uh, one farmer now is up to feeding 165 people. Uh, that's up from 155 about five years ago. So we're, we're doing more and more with less. But I saw a message this morning in Nick Pickett's presentation that I think needs to be out there. This oversupply of food that we have right now is a blessing. It is not anything but a blessing and, and it's fragile. Uh, when you heard Nick talk about just a drop in uh, 20 bushels per acre of corn production and there's no corn, uh, that can happen with any of these commodities anytime. Uh, unfortunately, it's going to be pretty much predicated on somebody else's disaster. Uh, another drought in the Midwest certainly would take that 20 bushels of corn away. A drought in Brazil, uh, floods 
uh, all of that can happen, but at the drop of the hat, this what is now almost choking farmers with oversupply can go away. Uh, it hadn't been that long ago, I think 2012, we had that massive drought in the Midwest. Uh, and luckily for North Carolina, we had record yields and, yet, and record prices. That, that was six years ago. And that has deteriorated to where we are today, but it won't last forever. I, I just, you know, I think we're just around the corner from turning this around and being prosperous again. So, in conclusion, we have seen a crisis in agriculture in 2018. We're resilient, uh, we're determined, dynamic, uh, and we're going to come back. And it's going to be stronger than ever. We will be a $100 billion industry in North Carolina shortly. It may not be like we have known it in the past. There are going to be changes. That, that's going to be inevitable. But I remain confident in agriculture and agribusiness in North Carolina, and, and I hope you will too. One thing that I do want to do is once again thank Erica Peterson and the Agribusiness Council. And I know John asked the new president is here. John, where are you? There he is, right there in the middle. John happens to be a neighbor of mine in Rockingham County and is somebody that I have known for many, many, many years. And I congratulate you and am confident in your leadership ability. So we'll be working with you, John.